That was what was on my calendar. And that's what's on Meta 200 calendar, too. I don't know what happened there. But then, one, two, one, two.
my name is Anne Dixon. Um, I'm Chief of Pulmonary Critical Care and Director of the Mont Lung Center um, here at the Alana College of Medicine. And I would like to welcome you all um, to this, the fourth and final uh, lectures in our Community Medical School series. Um, first, uh, just a few housekeeping things. I hope you've all received some evaluation sheets as you walked in. Please do fill those in, that's incredibly helpful. And on your way out, hand them to the uh, events team at the back. Um, there will be uh, 30 minutes uh, for questions and answers um, after the lecture, so if you could just hold your questions. And then at the end of the lecture, uh, there will be microphones, um, and uh, you will be handed a microphone. If you could please wait to ask your question until you've got a microphone, that would be great. Those are the housekeeping things, but uh, my real pleasure and honor tonight um, is to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Dan Weiss. Uh, who's a professor of medicine uh, in the Lana College of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Weiss uh, received his uh, MD and PhD degree in pharmacology from Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York, uh, then trained in internal medicine um, at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, uh, before uh, completing pulmonary and critical care training uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, where I was proud to be a colleague of his. Uh, he was uh, recruited uh, to the University of Vermont, I think, back in 2001. Um, and uh, Dan um, is uh, really an international leader uh, in the field of gene and stem cell therapy in lung disease. Um, he has authored over uh, 150 publications, book chapters. He is a major leading researcher in this world. He has had uh, MDs, uh, PhDs, uh, graduate students from around the world who come to train in his lab. He uh, has gone around the world giving talks uh, on the subject that you're going to hear about today. Uh, in 2005, he started a, a stem cell uh, therapy uh, and bioengineering and lung disease conference uh, here in Vermont. Uh, this conference takes place every two years and attracts leading researchers from around the world. Uh, we are really tremendously privileged to have someone of Dr. Weiss's stature as a member of our faculty. And so without any further ado, um, I would like to uh, welcome Dan, who among his other accolades is also the Chief Scientific Officer of the International Society for Cellular Therapies. Thank you, Dan. All right, can everyone hear me all right? Okay, very good. So uh, I wanna thank Dr. Dixon for that overly um, generous introduction. Um, what we're gonna do tonight is cover a lot of territory. And as uh, Dr. Dixon said, I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician, so I spend part of my time in the hospital taking uh, care of patients with lung diseases and working in the intensive care unit. So see some pretty sick people. The rest of my time, I work in a laboratory. And I run a lab that's focused on regenerative medicine for lung diseases. So we're trying to do things like grow lungs outside of the body and some really interesting science fiction come to life uh, type of endeavors. Uh, and in the course of that, uh, we do a lot of work with stem cells. And so I've uh, been immersed in the field of stem cells for a number of years now. And what I wanna do tonight is take you on a journey. It's gonna be through the excitement, the hope, all the really interesting and forward-looking things that are going on with stem cell research. And also, we're gonna cover the other side, um, the things that have taken place that are problematic in the world of stem cells and potential stem cell therapies. And we're gonna cover base uh, on all of this. I'm gonna talk for about 45 minutes to an hour, somewhere in there. And I'm actually gonna engage you in conversation, uh, a little bit of question and answer during the presentation, and then we'll have a formal question and answer period afterwards. So as Dr. Dixon said, um, professor here, I'm also the chief scientific officer for one of the leading stem cell scientific organizations uh, globally. And this will become important as we get further into the talk. Now in terms of uh, disclosures, um, I get a fair amount of research funding uh, to do my uh, work uh, from institutes like the uh, National Institutes of Health, Department of Defense, uh, private foundations, nonprofit disease foundations like the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. I also get industry funding from companies like United Therapeutics 
which has a presence in Vermont, uh, Athersis, and others. Okay, here's the overview. Here's what we're gonna talk about. So regenerative medicine, we're gonna go through a few ground rules and definitions. And then we're gonna talk about stem cells. Now one of the concepts that's out there is that there is a stem cell. And it's not true. There are a variety of different types of stem cells. And we're gonna go through the more common ones that have been looked at for potential therapeutic uses. And these include uh, ones you've heard about, embryonic stem cells. Everyone's heard about these, right? It's very much in the news uh, for a number of years. We're also gonna talk about other populations, things like induced pluripotent stem cells, endogenous progenitor cells, hematopoietic stem cells, which many of you have heard about, and uh, mesenchymal stem cells. I'm gonna make each one of these clear to you and the current state of what we understand about them and how they pot uh, potentially can be used in different therapeutic applications. And then we're gonna talk about unproven stem cell therapies. Now, why is this important to you? Uh, there are so many things that uh, we learn about biology uh, as we study stem cells. Obviously, early development, tissue repair, uh, stem cells are critically important, and we're still learning a lot about that. Disease research, drug development, new pharmaceuticals, cell-based therapies, and then the tissue engineering <coughs> that we'll talk quite a bit about in terms of regenerative medicine. So, what is regenerative medicine? Now, there are a number of ways to think about it, and the way I like to do this is to break it down into three components. The first is to stimulate the body's own repair mechanisms to heal otherwise uh, irreparable tissues. So if you think about it, if you get a cut in your skin, your skin's gonna heal, right? Usually fairly well. If you have an injury in your brain, for example, the brain doesn't necessarily heal as well. And so if we can understand uh, how to make that healing process more effective, more efficient, then that's a significant pillar of regenerative medicine. If you can't do that, then another concept in regenerative medicine is, can we grow new tissues or organs in the laboratory that we could then subsequently implant or transplant and use to uh, replace that defective organ? So um, I do this. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do is grow lungs outside of the body that we can use for transplantation for people who need them. So this is actually feasible, and uh, there are clinical uses of some tissues, things like skin for burn victims, for example, bone, cartilage, can be grown to some degree outside of the body and used therapeutically. Here's a kind of a strange looking picture of an ear uh, being grown outside of the body. Uh, but for more complex organs, like heart, lung, liver, brain, these are still scientific processes, uh, developments in evolution. All right, so if you can't do this, then the third arm, the way I think about this in terms of regenerative medicine, is can we develop a device that takes the place of the defective or failed organ? Does anybody have uh, an idea of uh, a device that has been around for a long time that uh, serves this purpose? So hips need so a variety of orthopedic applications, absolutely, yeah. Uh, Yep, so you're on the right track. And hold that thought for a second. All right, yes? Kidney dialysis. Kidney dialysis. There you go. So artificial hemodialysis has been around for years. And if you think about it, this is one way of thinking about regenerative medicine. Another one that was just mentioned is a left ventricular assist device. So artificial hearts. So here's a picture of a heart with, uh, you can see a variety of mechanical tubing leading to a pump that's strapped to the body, if you will. And this pump serves uh, to augment this failing heart function, all right? It's an artificial heart. It's not implanted in the chest, it's more of a bridge for a patient who has a failing heart waiting for a heart transplant to become available or for a patient who is never gonna qualify for that heart transplant for whatever reason and helps improve their quality of life. So these are the three arms of regenerative medicine to think about. Now, who was the first regenerative medicine scientist? Anybody have an idea? She, she wrote a very famous book in the 1800s that is a classic of our literature. Mary Shelley. 
all right? So we're just trying to catch up with uh, science fiction in terms of regenerative medicine. All right, so let's talk about stem cells. So you all have heard about embryonic stem cells, right? Embryonic stem cells have been touted to do everything under the sun, all right? And you can see in this uh, schematic, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, baldness, blindness, et cetera. And so there's a lot of excitement, and theoretically there's an unlimited therapeutic potential for use of embryonic stem cells. So let's look a little bit more uh, in detail about them. Where do we get embryonic stem cells from? So this is a schematic of normal fetal development in humans, and you see how you go from that single fertilized egg, and it divides into two cells, and then four cells, eight cells, 16, and by about five or six days after implantation, you have uh, this round ball of cells with an outer layer and an inner layer, we call it a blastocyst. And then subsequently after that, you'll get the various stages of fetal development. In this picture, we only go up to 20 weeks. So where do we get the embryonic stem cells from? I heard somebody say blastocyst, and that is absolutely right. So let's look at it. Uh, more detailed picture. It's a very colorful, busy uh, slide from Scientific American. But here's this fertilized egg, and here's this five to six day blastocyst, and you can see there's an, in, an outer mass in blue and an inner cell mass in brown. Now, during normal embryonic development, the cells in this inner cell mass would then subsequently differentiate and begin to specialize into these red and green and blue cells that in terms of scientific terminologies are the different lineages in the developing embryo. So endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. Uh, but the important thing is that uh, you can see that from endoderm you get things like pancreas, lung, thyroid, bladder. From the mesoderm you get structural tissues like bone marrow, uh, bone muscle, et cetera. And the ectoderm gives skin and the nervous system. So when we are trying to utilize embryonic stem cells uh, in the laboratory and then for therapeutic uses, what is done is to remove this inner cell mass, put it into petri dishes and the like, and then we try and recapitulate normal embryonic development in a petri dish. And the idea is if we can direct these inner cell mass cells down any one of these lineages, then that's the goal of utilizing embryonic stem cells. All right, everybody with me? So a little bit more about this is that um, this is still relatively recent. I mean, mouse embryonic stem cells have been studied since the 1960s, but <clears throat> in terms of human embryonic stem cells, it's really only been about 20 years uh, since uh, this work has started. And again, the goal is that these cells can differentiate into all the different adult tissues. So now let's go back to a very important question. Where do we get, where do we actually get the embryonic stem cells that we work with in the laboratory? Do we get these, I'm gonna ask a very pointed question, from aborted fetuses or miscarriages? Yes or no? Okay, the answer is a resounding no. At least in the United States, Canada, Europe, Australia, things like that. <clears throat> we do not use fetal tissues for embryonic stem cell research, okay? Why? Because the embryo, embryonic stem cell is from this five to six day old small mass of cells, not from a fetus at any stage of fetal development. Is everybody clear about that? Okay, where do we then get the embryonic stem cells that we actually work from? In vitro fertilization, all right? So let's explain how that works. So when a couple trying to conceive goes to an in vitro fertilization clinic, um, sperm and eggs are received and they're put together. And the goal for the clinic is to uh, create a number of fertilized eggs. Some of these get implanted um, and hopefully they'll take the whole goal of in vitro fertilization. Uh, but many of them don't get utilized and they get frozen down and stored away for potential future use. Sometimes they never get used. And so under strict conditions of informed consent and legal oversight and regulatory oversight, 
Some of these um, additional fertilized eggs are donated for use in research. That's where we get the embryonic stem cells from. Everybody with me about that? Everybody clear? Good. Okay. So how do you potentially use an embryonic stem cell then? Well, there are two ways of thinking about it. Again, the goal is to repair damaged or diseased tissue. So one way, one mechanism is just to take the embryonic stem cell itself and inject it. Inject it into the bloodstream or inject it into an organ as an undifferentiated embryonic stem cell. And then somehow it will be influenced by the environment to develop into that particular tissue or organ. So if you inject it in the brain, for example, then the brain will influence it to turn into a, a neuron and help treat Parkinson's disease, for example. Now that really doesn't work very well. So the more effective way of doing this is that you actually differentiate the embryonic stem cells to that desired tissue, to turn it into, for example, a neuron in that Petri dish and then inject that neuron into the brain to try and treat something like Parkinson's disease, okay? So this is how it works. Now, the reality, right? We've heard about embryonic stem cells for years and years and years and years. And so in terms of clinical trials, the first one uh, was done uh, as an industry, a pharmaceutical industry sponsored trial. The company was uh, Giron. And the target disease was a particularly devastating type of muscular dystrophy called spinal motor atrophy. Uh, it's just a horrible disease to have. And so uh, Jaron wanted to address this for all the right reasons. Because they were the first ones, they spent years and years and millions and millions of dollars um, because they had to go through all of the preclinical testing, so animal testing, laboratory benchtop testing, and they had to spend a lot of time with the FDA because everyone was being so careful and so considerate about this because this was going to be the first one and for all the right reasons. So they finally went through this and they got to the first three patients. And uh, the way this was done for a muscular dystrophy was to actually inject the cells directly into the spinal cord. That's where the problem of the disease is. So the first three patients all had allergic reactions. Each one of them got a rash, a skin rash, at the site of the uh, injection. And the trial was immediately halted because at that time nobody knew whether this was a side effect of the embryonic stem cell injection or not. Uh, it turns out that it had nothing to do with the embryonic stem cells, but it was reflective of the buffer, if you will, the vehicle that the stem cells were suspended in when they were injected. That's what the patients were reacting to. But Giron said, we're done. We've had it. Um, we've spent all this time and money, and, and we don't know what to do anymore. So they stopped. So now, when you try and find out, really, what is the real clinical applicability of embryonic stem cells out there, um, there's a resource, and it's called clinicaltrials.gov. Here's the web address for it. And this is a repository that is managed by the National Institutes of Health. And what is listed here are all clinical trials in the United States, Europe, and other places that have been registered onto this site. It's meant to be an ultimate database. So when you go to this clinicaltrials.gov, you can find um, 22 current trials involving embryonic stem cells. Uh, the vast majority of these, 19 of them, are for ophthalmologic diseases, mostly macular degeneration, right? So a disease of the eyes, uh, particularly with aging. And what's done here is that you derive cells in the retina, that back part of the eye, from the embryonic stem cells, and then they're injected in, into the eyeball, and uh, hopefully that they'll take and uh, restore the damaged retina and end up restoring sight. That's the whole goal of this. So there's some promising data uh, certainly there's good safety data and maybe some initial efficacy data. The vast majority of these trials for um, this particular condition are in Japan, a few in the United States. Uh, there is one trial listed again in this, in this uh, reference database for uh, cardiac disease, in this case heart failure, and again you have derived cardiac so heart cells from the embryonic stem cells, and so far the data available is that there have been no adverse uh, events that happened after these cells were injected uh, directly into the heart. 
And so there's a safety information, but there's no proof that it's gonna have any effectiveness or efficacy. Um, then there are two other trials, one for Parkinson's disease, one for um, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Lou Gehrig's disease. Um, in both of these trials, um, the embryonic stem cells are differentiated into neurons and then injected directly. And so far, um, one in China, one in Israel, there's no available data uh, either on safety or outcomes. These are early in evolution at this point. All right, so this is the reality with embryonic stem cells. Now, are there downsides for embryonic stem cells? Oh, and so uh, right now embryonic stem cells are many years from clinical use. Uh, are there issues with using embryonic stem cells? Anybody have any ideas? What kind of things have um, affected embryonic stem cells? Okay, good. So they might, you think you're telling them to turn into neurons, but they may not, okay? We don't have complete control over that. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. So that's a very good point. But what else, what has what really colored the embryonic stem cell field? Absolutely, so there are ethical, religious, moral, political considerations for use of embryonic stem cells. All, these are all valid, important considerations, okay? And the, state the obvious. But then the embryonic stem cells that we just heard, <coughs> excuse me, uh, can go bad. Um, does anybody know uh, what a teratoma is? Has anybody heard that term? Okay, so a teratoma is a tumor that in, in many respects is fetal development gone bad, okay? Um, this, I'm gonna show you a fairly unpleasant picture of a teratoma. So this is a massive tissue that contains, there's fat, hair, there's a tooth, muscle, skin. So this uh, happens, unfortunately, approximately uh, in every, one in every 40,000 pregnancies. It's just an unfortunate um, thing that can happen. Um, but the embryonic stem cells that we take out and try and work with in the laboratory uh, can do this too. And we don't have any control over this as of yet. So this is a, a, a continued scientific worry about use of embryonic stem cells. Okay, so if not embryonic stem cells, what other stem cells out there? Now, has anybody heard the term induced pluripotent stem cell? Okay, good, a couple people. So this gets um, a little bit more into hard science, uh, but let's, let's take a look at it. So normally during embryonic development, there are lots of genes that are turned on that guide the uh, embryonic development. And uh, when after birth, many of them are turned off. They're no longer needed. But if you can figure out how to turn some of these back on, then you can actually take an adult cell and de-differentiate it into the functional equivalent of an embryonic stem cell. So let's, let's take a look at how this might work. So a very common way of doing this is just to simply take a small piece of skin, a skin biopsy, and turn on, a, whoops, come back. Uh, turn on a few genes that are, again, normally turned off after embryonic fetal development is completed, and then you can take that skin cell, de-differentiate it into this IPS, this induced pluripotent stem cell, which is the adult functional equivalent of an embryonic stem cell. And then what you can do is use all those tricks that you learned with embryonic stem cells uh, and try and then differentiate these, again, along all the different tissue lineages that uh, you're trying to use potentially therapeutically. All right, so you can see the excitement of this, and you can see also how it takes away all of the religious, moral, political, ethical considerations. No one is gonna object if someone takes a, a piece of skin, does all this, and then injects that back into the same person for some hopeful therapeutic uh, avenue. Everybody with me on this? Okay, the importance of this is underscored by the fact that the individual, Shinya Yamanaka, a Japanese uh, investigator, uh, won the Nobel Prize for discovering this approximately five years after he discovered it. What's the normal lag time for that eureka moment uh, for a Nobel laureate to the find that the, <laughs> to the when they finally get it? Yeah, 30, 40, 50 years, okay? So this hugely underscores the importance of this discovery. All right, so this is good. Um, are there downsides to induced pluripotent stem cells? 
Anybody have an idea? Again, all, this, all the really interesting, potentially therapeutic things you can do with embryonic stem cells, you can do with iPSCs. You've taken away all, again, the religious, moral, political, ethical you know, considerations. What are the potential downsides? Teratoma, same as ESCs, okay? So this is a significant limitation. There's another one, which is, uh, again, a scientific, uh, a little bit more hard science, but a really interesting one. And that is something called epigenetic memory. Once a skin cell, always a skin cell, okay? Now the way this works is that you could take a look at DNA. Okay, so here's your double-stranded DNA, just like everybody learned back in science. And uh, this will divide and replicate, and uh, that's how, how it works. But it turns out that there's some stop gaps, some checkpoints on this process. And that has to do with the fact that they're small, well, they're methyl groups uh, at various points along the DNA strand, double strand. There are also proteins called histones that live at different points along that DNA strand. And they're different for every type of cell. So the pattern of methyl groups and histone groups in a skin cell is gonna be different than it is for a, a neuron or a heart cell, okay? So what that means is you can take that skin cell and then turn on those genes that are normally off during embryonic, uh, once you've finished uh, fetal development, um, and then turn them back on and de-differentiate and take that skin cell and end up with a neuron, but at some level it still thinks it's a skin cell. So, I'm sorry? We don't know. Yeah, the question was will it change back? Uh, so far, once we've turned it into a neuron, we, we haven't seen neurons then decide that they're looking like skin cells, but on some molecular level, they still think they're a skin cell. So we don't know uh, what's gonna happen. And so take that a step further. So the next question is, is there any clinical trial with an induced pluripotent stem cell? And so um, when you go again to this clinicaltrials.gov website, uh, you can find actually 37 listings for induced pluripotent stem cells, but they're all to obtain cells for study. So cells from patients with different diseases, for example, none of them are interventional. No one yet is doing a trial in which you've taken an induced pluripotent stem cell or something derived from it and try to do something therapeutic with it. So we don't know down the road. So what can you do with induced pluripotent stem cells? Well, um, they're really powerful tools to understand disease-specific cellular and molecular physiology or pathology, if you will. So we can get, for example, skin biopsies, and we, we've done this here, from patients with uh, diseases like cystic fibrosis or sickle cell disease, and then we can de-differentiate them and then turn them into lung cells and study things in the, in the Petri dish that we think is gonna help us um, understand and move more effectively towards a, a, a treatment. And the, these are also phenomenal tells, uh, cells for drug testing. All right, so embryonic stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, what else is out there? So we have something called endogenous progenitor cells, uh, right? Is, is that term familiar to anybody or come across anybody as of yet? All right, good. So it turns out every organ, every adult organ has its own stem cells, all right? We walk around full of stem cells at this point. Uh, as, as fully functioning adults, and their role is that they're thought to respond to injury or to aging, and I'll show you a little bit about this. So they're found everywhere. You can look in virtually every tissue, and I've listed some here, from bone marrow all the way down to teeth, and there are s populations of cells that serve as stem cells. So I'm gonna show you a schematic here. So this is, this is what I do. This is what lungs look like, if you will. Okay, so here's the trachea, okay, the windpipe, and then it branches and branches and branches and branches until you finally get down to those alveoli, which is where oxygen goes in and carbon dioxide goes out. And when you look at a schematic here, you can see that there are lots of different cells that line the upper, the middle, the lower parts of the lungs, um, and they're many, many different types of cells, but there are a couple of rare populations. So up here, you've got that green cell in this upper part. In this middle part, you've got these little blue cells. 
Further down, you've got that red cell, and, and all the way down, you've got another green cell. These are cells that should there be injury to the lung of some type, have the ability to divide and replicate themselves, but also di differentiate into the other cells of the lung to try and repair an injury. It's like getting a cut in your skin, uh, and there's a skin stem cell that will turn into mature functioning skin cells, if you will. All right, so very exciting. And we all have these, and we all have them on a daily basis. So again, they're, they're felt to function in development and also in repair. One theory of aging is that uh, part of the aging process is a, def a defect in the ability of these endogenous uh, uh, progenitor cells to keep on doing what they do. They, they get old and they don't repair themselves as well. Very interesting uh, theory with this. Found in every organ, most of our knowledge uh, those is still in mice. We're still learning about these in humans. So there's a lot of possibility here. Uh, we don't know uh, enough about their regulation, their homeostasis, what, what makes them tick, what makes them go bad. And they can go bad. And this is the dark side of endogenous progenitor cells. They may be cancer stem cells. So let me show you another picture here. And this is, again, this is my world in, in terms of the lungs. And so this is what the lining, here's the airway. Here's a pretty picture uh, showing all the different types of cells. And it, it's not the details I want you to focus on. It's this little blue cell. There are a couple of these little blue cells. And these are the progenitor cells in the lung. And normally they should just stay quiet and reproduce when you need them to reproduce. But if you injure them or you tax them with something like cigarette smoking, then it, they begin to go bad and they begin to proliferate, they begin to get out of control, and the theory is that this is where a lot of lung cancer comes from, okay? Uh, smoking is the trigger, but this is the mechanism by which you develop the cancer. So there is a dark side to these endogenous progenitor cells, and so there are many years from clinical application at this point. But again, fascinating to consider. All right, so what about other adult stem cell populations in the body? And now we're gonna go back to a little bit more familiar territory uh, into the bone marrow. So you all have heard about bone marrow transplants. These have been around for year, for many, many years. And like um, Dr. Dixon and I actually trained at a bone marrow transplant center in Seattle uh, many, many years ago. Um, and the bone marrow, it turns out, is a storehouse for a variety of different stem cells. And I'm gonna talk to you about two of them in particular. One is a hematopoietic stem cell, the other is the mesenchymal stromal cell, HSC and MSC. So take a closer look at the HSC, and it's over here, and this is a cell that will give rise to red blood cells, all the different white blood cells, and the platelets, so the major components of the body. So how does this work, and, and how do we uh, think about this, how do we use these therapeutically? So this is where bone marrow transplantation comes in. So, if you have, unfortunately, a uh, disease like leukemia, lymphoma, some other less common um, hematologic type of conditions, uh, treatment uh, is oftentimes very intense chemotherapy with and without radiation therapy. And the idea for this intense therapy is to wipe out the cancer cells. And that's the goal. But part of the problem is that when you do this, you also wipe out the bone marrow. And so you don't have any more functioning hematopoietic stem cells, and so you have no more blood cells. So the idea of a bone marrow transplant is to restore the bone marrow, okay? So the way it works is that you can get the hematopoietic stem cells um, from bone marrow, uh, you can get them from circulating blood as well too. And there are two ways of getting these. You can get them from the individual patient who has the leukemia, who's gonna get that chemotherapy, um, and then you store them and you give them back to that same patient. This is called autologous. Or you can get them from somebody else and then um, give them to that patient who had undergone the chemotherapy and needs their bone marrow restored. And this is called allogeneic, all right? So the idea being is you take the bone marrow or blood, uh, you collect these hematopoietic stem cells, and then the patient gets the chemotherapy, which as a side effect, destroys the bone marrow, and then the cells are then reinfused into the blood and you reconstitute the bone marrow. 
This has been FDA approved for years and years. The, um, some of the original investigators, E. Donald Thomas in Seattle, for example, received the Nobel Prize in medicine for developing this t uh, technique and this approach. So this is legitimate stem cell therapy, okay, with hematopoietic stem cells. What about the other cell in the bone marrow? So these are the MSCs, those mesenchymal stromal cells, and this is where um, a lot of excitement has been recently, but this is, we're gonna talk shortly, where a lot of abuse has been as well too. So the idea is that here's a mesenchymal stem cell, and these were originally found in bone marrow, but it turns out you can get them out of a pretty wide variety of tissues. You can get them out of adipose, so fat tissue, placenta, cord blood, and others, and they do have an actual stem roll. They can turn, they're well recognized to be able to turn into bone, fat, or cartilage, okay? But the real excitement about them is that they function in immune regulation. And let me show you how that works. So the cells live along blood vessels. So here's a blood vessel. Here's one of these MSCs, and you can see it sits on the outside, and it does, what it does is it samples the blood going by, and this is <coughs> um, uh, just the, the cleanest way of thinking about it. It samples the blood, and what it does, if there's something that is causing inflammation or infection, the MSCs will be able to detect that and what they do is then they secrete, they release a variety, a portfolio, if you will, of anti-inflammatory substances, things that will help counteract that inflammation or what have you, that insult. And so the way it works is that they inhibit immune cells. So this is uh, colorful, a little complicated, but hope, let's, make, let's go through this uh, step by step. Here is the MSC. Here are different immune cells. So a B cell or a T cell, so as you've heard about. And what happens is that the MSC can release all these different things, PGE2, IL-6. These are secreted anti-inflammatory substances that will then and go turn off the activity of those activated immune cells. Everybody with me on this one? Okay. All right, now it turns out also that the MSCs themselves uh, and this is a bit simplistic, but they don't necessarily provoke an immune response to the cells. So think about, think about it in this way. Think about blood um, uh, transfusion. Uh, you have a blood type A, you've got a blood type B, and a blood type O. You cannot give blood type A into a blood type B recipient because it's mismatched. They have the wrong markers on the surface of the cells. Uh, but you can give O to anybody. So MSCs are like type O. You can essentially give MSCs to anybody and they won't have that immune reaction, okay? Because of this, um, you can do allogeneic use. I can take my MSCs and give them to you um, if there is a good reason to do so, right? So, yeah, uh, this has taken a lot of steps in terms of potential clinical applicability and there have been a large number of clinical trials uh, for a wide range of autoimmune and inflammatory and now other diseases. And I'm giving you a list of some of these, graft host disease is um, a complication of bone marrow transplantation. Crohn's disease, um, some of you, many of you may be familiar with this, multiple sclerosis and the like. And what's happened is that there's a huge amount of scientific literature that supports this um, and some limited success in clinical trials at this point. And so MSCs are actually approved, have marketing authorization for a small spectrum of specialized diseases in a limited part of the world. So this graft host disease, approved in Canada, Japan, and New Zealand, um, perianal fistulas and Crohn's disease. Anybody who's familiar with Crohn's knows that this is a horrible part of Crohn's disease, and MSCs are approved for this uh, in the European Union. And then um, something called critical limb ischemia, which is a vascular disease, uh, there's approval in India. There is no approved MSC-based therapy in the United States, okay? Remember this. All right, so let's take an interim summary. So we've talked about regenerative medicine, okay, uh, as to what it is. We've talked about the variety of different uh, stem cells that are out there and are actively being investigated and that all have their own potential 
uh, therapeutic uh, applicability and potential usefulness, um, there are, again, the approved FDA um, long proven uses of uh, hematopoietic stem cells for bone marrow transplantation. And again, there's uh, limited uh, approval for MSCs. Uh, so again, promising research for these other ones, but again, no approved therapies in the United States. All right, any, any questions before we move on? Yes? A big pardon? Cerebral surgery. MSCs generally don't circulate in the blood, all right? And so let me explain that a little bit. So they live in the bone marrow, they live in fat, they live in placenta. You can extract them from all those tissues, grow them in tissue culture and manipulate them and, and try and use them therapeutically. But it, it's um, unusual to find them circulating in the blood. This has been a debatable point for uh, a number of years. You can sometimes provoke them to leave the bone marrow and circulate around in the blood, but generally the weight of the evidence is that they do not do that, and that would include the cerebral circulation. Yes, sir. Well, let's, let's, so th we're gonna come to that, actually. So um, just real quick, because uh, there's more to go here. I, I well, they are, they, they are. So the idea is that you harvest the bone marrow or the blood prior to the chemotherapy, and then you store it away so that when it's done, you can then break it out and use them again. All right, um, I'm, see that? Well, okay, please. Potentially, potentially. So, so one idea is, so the question is, um, where do you give the MSCs? And so one idea is that you put them right where the source is. Another idea is you put them in the bloodstream and let them circulate around and hopefully they will end up where you want them to be. We're gonna get to that, all right? So let me move on. <coughs> so all this good stuff, now let's talk about unproven stem cell therapies. And I suspect that is what most of you wanna hear about tonight as well. So one picture says it all. Okay, <laughs> this is the problem, okay? There is so much potential good out there, but the, um, what's happening is that there is an, an increasing amount of offerings for stem cell therapies for everything under the sun that are unproven at this point. So let's go through this, okay? Again, the, re the reality is uh, very few cell-based therapies are standard of care or approved by regulatory agencies, okay? Um, but you're a patient and you've got a chronic, uh, painful, debilitating disease, you want something, okay? Uh, none of us presume, I don't presume to put myself in the shoes of any patient with a need, okay? And we'll, we're gonna come back to this, okay? So what this has resulted is in a high global demand for stem cell-based therapies and the problematic answer is that there's been a proliferation of uh, uh, so-called stem cell clinics that offer unproven, uh, untested, frequently or, or sometimes potentially dangerous uh, therapies. And th the problem is exacerbated that um, because the United States has the FDA, European Union has a, a something called the EMA, very comparable, strictly regulatory body, but there are places in the world that don't have the degree of regulatory activity that, that we do, and this has helped to foment the problem. So, right need, wrong answer, okay? All right, so let's divest, uh, divest, let's diverge a little bit here, okay? Why, do we, why is this so important, okay? And this, has, this goes back now to um, the history of drug regulation and new therapeutic regulation in the United States. So, anybody here, read, have read The Jungle by Upton Sinclair? Yeah, right, okay, so that's a big part of what provoked um, the initial uh, 120 years ago, what have you, um, establishment of the FDA, is because of abuses and, and things like that, all right? Um, then in, it wasn't until 1938 that safety testing was mandated 
for new therapeutics and pharmaceuticals and what have you. And uh, unfortunately, many of you will remember thalidomide, okay? Uh, so it wasn't, but it wasn't until 1962 that in addition to safety, you had to show that the drug had efficacy, that it did something beneficial and that the benefit risk was worth it, okay? Snake oil, okay? This is a, in large part what drove the FDA uh, creation and maturation. So how does this work? Okay, so let's say you have a new drug, a new wonder drug, it's gonna cure something. What you do is you start uh, a long, admittedly arduous, complicated process to get something from start to finish. And this is the way it works. So the FDA has what they call an IND, investigational new drug or investigational new device. So you put together all your information, you have all of your laboratory testing, if there's animal testing that needs to be involved, you get that all lined up. You bring it to the FDA and you go through this phase zero where you convince them then to go into a phase one, which is a very small trial. It's usually 10 people on average, give or take, in which you give different doses of this new therapeutic and the primary outcome is safety. Safety, okay? If you show safety, then you can move on to this phase two which is a medium-sized trial of people um, that is designed to continue safety evaluations, but also begin to show that there really is some efficacy. And then if that works, then you go on to the huge trial that you hear about with thousands of people and like to show that your treatment is at least as good as, if not better than the current standard of care. Okay, and once that's all done, then you can go to approval. Now this is a hugely cumbersome process. Okay, deliberately so um, because of all the bad things that have happened in the past, but you, as a patient, uh, as a caregiver, as a family member, it's frustrating. So what the, F and, and all the more so because you start out with uh, you know, 10,000 compounds to get one final approval drug. Okay, this is the um, reality of how that works. Okay, so what the FDA has tried to do is recognize this, particularly in the area of cell therapies, stem cell therapies. And so what they've been doing is trying to speed the process. So this is uh, from earlier this year. And there, at that time, in January of 19, uh, there were 800, 800 active investigational new drug or investigational new device applications for cell therapy or gene therapy products, okay? So what the FDA said, well, we're gonna project and we think that there, by 2020, there'll be greater than 200 of these applications a year. Uh, by 2025, we want to get 10 to 20 new therapies approved uh, per year. So we're going to bring on additional people. We're going to update our guidance documents uh, uh, for this uh, particular area. And we're also going to develop accelerated pathways. Okay, and one of the accelerated pathways that was developed is something called the Regenerative Medicine Advanced Therapy, RMAT. And so what this is meant to do is again, find a treatment or modify or reverse cure a serious life-threatening disease, et cetera. And the idea being is that you could move ahead if you had some preliminary safety data and some preliminary efficacy data. And then um, you could move on to that larger trial or actually potentially move on to marketing and use if you could collect post, what's called post-marketing data. So let's say you had a new drug you sped through the process and you got it out on the market, what you're committed to do is you have to follow those, as a drug company, you have to follow those patients and you have to monitor them and find out if uh, A, it truly is a safe uh, new therapy over time and B, is it really an efficacious? Is it working? Does it do anything? The idea being is that you wanted to cut all these years and et cetera off this process. So it's, so it's a well thought through well-intentioned and we'll have to see how it goes. But right now, <coughs> as of September, there were 108 uh, RMAT uh, requests received, 40 were granted, 40. So this process is moving ahead pretty quickly. Um, and the indications uh, vary pretty widely, stroke, spinal cord injury, et cetera. Uh, and the, the major benefit was to accelerate the regulatory approval process. And these are some of the companies that have received RMAT designations. Um, and, and this includes 
Juno, for example, here, and some of you may have heard about CAR T's, these new T cell therapies that are out there, um, that are really proving to be uh, a, a, a wonder approach uh, in terms of different cancers, if you will. So this is th what the FDA has tried to do to speed this up. All right, now, one other concept to introduce to you is medical tourism. Anybody ever heard that term? Okay, so where did medical, where did the term come from? Anybody remember this? Yeah, exactly right. So, so basically you travel to a country with less stringent regulations to uh, obtain a treatment not otherwise available. Does anyone recall one of the major things that stimulated this um, concept and the, and, and the name? Anybody, what's that? What are those? Apricots, okay. Laetro, God's wonder drug. Okay, I'm not, that's not me. That's, this is the advertisement, okay? So does, did people remember Laetro? Okay, it was this derivative of almond pits, I'm, I'm so sorry, apricots, that were supposed to, that was supposed to be a cancer, uh, an effective cancer, anti-cancer uh, therapeutic. But it's not legal in the United, it was never legal, never offered in the United States. So patients who wanted to get Laetro therapy went where? <laughs> Tijuana, or the, uh, some of the Caribbean islands to get this. Now what happened to these patients? What's the dirty little secret about Laetrile? So what is Laetrile? Laetrile is two glucose, so sugar, plus a nice little side dose of cyanide, and a little benzene on top of that, okay? This killed people, all right? And so it, it never worked. It was bogus from the, from the get-go, but again, people went ab abroad, went outside of the United States to pursue this therapy. Why? Because they were desperate. They had cancer, they were dying, and so this was offered to them, okay? Medical tourism. So how does this translate into stem cell medical tourism? So this has proliferated over the past number of years. This is a slide which is already five years old, if you will, okay, uh, and, and the like, and it shows the number of clinics or percentage of clinics globally. So this isn't just a, a US problem, American problem, this is a global problem. <clears throat> right, this estimated 60,000 patients treated every year is a gross underestimate, you know, because nobody's really tracking all this data. Um, but why is this out there? Whoa, look at the money, okay? All right, if you wanna make money, offer stem cell, okay? All right, and so this is bad, okay? And it's, it's worse, okay? Now, how do you define an unproven cell-based therapy? Yes, of course. How can you offer a drug to be able to treat Good, we're gonna come to that. And this is, we're getting to the crux of this issue right now, okay? So, but how do you, how do you define an unproven cell-based therapy, okay? Uh, there's an unclear scientific rationale to suggest it's gonna work, okay? There's lack of understanding of the mechanisms or biologic function to support clinical use. Insufficient data from laboratory studies, animal studies, or any clinical study that says A, it's safe, but B, it works, okay? Lack of, believe it or not, standardized approach to confirm quality or manufacturing consistency. Not always the case, but this has been part of the problem for some of the stem cell clinics out there. Uh, inadequate information in terms of informed consent. This is a huge issue, okay? Does everybody understand informed consent? Okay, all right. And then uh, oftentimes non-standardized, non-validated methods of administration. So how does this work? Oh, I'm sorry, before we get to that. So um, what kind of offerings are out there? So again, this is data that is a um, number of years old right now, but you can see um, what these individuals did was look in the United States at the businesses that offered stem cell therapy of some type and it, it's always hard to read things when they're sideways, but orthopedics, pain, sports injury, neurologic, et cetera. Okay, so you can see the distribution of offerings uh, for these types of, of therapies, all right? And what kind of cells were out there? Were they mostly these MSCs, okay? And so uh, MSCs again found in bone marrow, fat, um, amniotic fluid as well. So the vast majority of this pie chart are MSCs. So MSCs, even though they have promise, 
and they have some legitimate approved uses in other countries, not in the United States, um, are the usually the main focus of the stem cell clinics, okay? And then in terms of administration, um, there's no rhyme or reason sometimes. IV, uh, intrathecal, which means directly into, for example, the spinal, col spinal cord, intramuscular, nebulized, breathing in cells, okay? There, there, there's just simply no data on this, if you will. And so uh, these are the types of things that are out there. Now, how does this work? Okay, so many of the clinics will uh, offer a procedure in which you come into the clinic and there's a sample of fat or bone marrow or blood that's taken and then it's processed somehow. Okay, and we're gonna come back to your point very strongly in a second. And then uh, whatever these cells are, uh, they're, they're just re-injected back into the same, into you oft times the same day, all right? And that's gonna cure your orthopedic injury, your Parkinson's disease, your emphysema. It, it's, um, many of these clinics offer the same thing, same approach for a spectrum of diseases with no scientific rationale, okay? All right, now how, how can they get away with this? How does this happen, okay? Because your point is that why doesn't the FDA regulate this, okay? So the FDA absolutely regulates this, okay? So human cells and tissue-based products, this HCTPS, are considered drugs, okay? These are biologics, all right? This is something called Section 351, 351 of the Public Health Service, PHS Act. And so theoretically, ideally, rightly, any cell-based therapy has to go through the safety efficacy um, uh, steps for any, just like any other new drug. Um, accelerated through that RMAT, which is what the FDA is trying to do to speed this along, okay? But, but it turns out that there are exceptions to this rule. Now, it used to be in the United States that you could advertise for stem cell, you could offer by advertisement stem cell therapies, but you couldn't do it in the United States. People had to leave the country, go to, the, again, um, the Caribbean or Mexico, because those were easy to do. And, but then the industry figured out that cell products that are what are called minimally manipulated and intended for homologous use, not combined with any articles, uh, any other articles. What that means is that if I took, for example, a sample of blood, and I said, oh, there's stem cells in that blood, and I don't do anything to it. I don't grow them in tissue culture, I don't treat them with hormones or growth factors, or I don't shine light on them to change them, rev them up and activate them. But if I centrifuge them, if I take that blood sample, put it in a centrifuge so I can pellet down the cells, get rid of all the other stuff, that's legal if you put it back into the same person. That's how the clinics get around this, okay? And so um, uh, destined for use the same individual, uh, same surgical procedure, surgical exemption. So most stem cell businesses in the U.S. claim these two exemptions to avoid having their approaches classified as drugs and thus subject to FDA regulations. Okay, everybody, any questions on this? This is a critically important uh, point right now. Okay, all right, where are these clinics? And again, this is um, old data, okay? All right, okay, yes, there's a little red balloon in Vermont, okay? So, um, but where, where are most of these clinics? located, each, each little red balloon is a clinic. Florida, Texas, California, Arizona. Okay, why, why, who lives there? The older population, okay? The older population with more chronic accumulation of diseases. This is deliberate targeting in terms of the demographics, all right? Yes. Oh, good question, we're gonna come to that in a second, okay? Uh, so, what is the FDA, oh, I'm sorry, we're gonna, we are gonna come to that, but let me show you one other thing here too. So again, how do these uh, businesses work, right? So, um, misleading advertisement, misrepresentation of risks and benefits, weak or absent scientific rationale, patient targeting, tokens of scientific legitimacy. Now, don't, don't worry about all this, because we're gonna go through this individually. So, misleading advertisement, 
So direct to consumer advertising, social media, um, ad newspaper advertisements, this is from Denver, if you will, but some of you may have seen similar newspaper advertisements uh, locally, if you will, okay? Registration on clinicaltrials.gov. So remember that clinicaltrials.gov, this is the repository run by the National Institutes of Health where all legitimate clinical trials get listed. It turns out that the NIH um, unfortunately doesn't get enough money to police this site. So it is relatively simple to just uh, list yourself on clinicaltrials.gov and then have a token of legitimacy that, oh, it's on clinicaltrials.gov. Okay, so this is unfortunately a flawed system. The NIH, the FDA are very aware of that and trying to rectify this, but it's gonna take a lot of police work, right? <clears throat> Misrepresentation of risks and benefits. So portrayal of treatments as routine instead of experimental and unproven. Exaggerated claims of safety and efficacy, and then absence of uh, follow-up and real data, okay? All right, when I say real data, um, I'm not talking about testimonials. <coughs> testimonials have a purpose, but in terms of quantitative measurable data, um, that is usually what's lacking, all right? Patient targeting, so patient seminars, uh, essentially sales pitch, and um, there, those, uh, there have been some of those uh, locally, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, pressure to do crowdfunding, that this is an article that literally was in the Washington Post last week about a uh, stem cell clinic operating out of Florida. Beg, borrow, and heal, okay? Why? Does insurance pay for any of this stuff? No, of course not, because it's not proven. So this is out of pocket to add insult to injury. All right, tokens of scientific legitimacy. Many of these, these clinics will list accreditations by various bodies of what sound like legitimate um, scientific organizations, but there are a lot of organizations out there that really are industry tools and they're not re legitimate scientific organizations, okay, et cetera. Okay, now, um, this is bad. How does it get worse? I already showed you, I'm sorry. <laughs> So are there bad outcomes that have been reported? Yes. So many of you may have heard about this earlier this year, about three women who had um, stem cells injected into their eyes, and these weren't those embryonic stem cells we talked about earlier this evening, done under legitimate scientific uh, investigation. These were a clinic that said, hey, boom, and all three of them went blind, okay? So um, this clinic is, became a particular target of the FDA and uh, is no longer uh, in existence. But many of these clinics are like hydras. You cut off one head and six more grow back, and this is a real problem. There are other bad outcomes that have happened. There have been reports of death. Um, there have been tumors. And we think that the bad outcomes are grossly underreported. Why? If you're a clinic doing this, you're certainly not gonna publicize your bad outcomes. But oftentimes, the individuals who got the treatment don't realize that they're having about a, a, a bad outcome or they don't connect the dots. And so it, it doesn't get reported. And with the lack of good follow-up, um, essentially in many cases no follow-up, then there's no chance necessarily for the bad outcomes to get the type of um, visibility that they need to get. So what is happening right now? Now this didn't transfer well, I'm sorry, but um, what this is is a timeline with lots of things that the FDA has begun to uh, step up to the plate about. And it's not just the FDA, it's also the Federal Trade Commission. So we know what the Federal Trade Commission's purview is? Okay, FDA clearly is the science and legitimacy of all that stuff. What does the FTC do? Anybody? FTC regulates truth in advertising. Ah, yeah. So the FTC is now keenly aware of this industry, and so the FTC has begun to take actions and the like. There's a uh, increasing number of newspaper exposés. Uh, you really can't go by uh, any given week without a couple of um, national news or local news reporting trying to expose these clinics for what they are. The scientific um, professional organizations have long been coming up, uh, against these types of things as well. And these are just uh, some variety of headlines. Um, locally, um, can PCAR 
investigative reporter for uh, seven days, wrote a uh, really well done article earlier this earlier this year, March I think. Was it last year? Or Time flies. Okay, uh, on stem cell clinics um, and the stem cell clinics in Vermont. And so again, uh, the public is really beginning to catch on, if you will. This is one of the best things that happened. Google made a decision uh, September of 2019 to ban stem cell clinic ads, okay? Why is this so important? Because a lot of the marketing, a lot of the outreach by these clinics is social media. Where do people get their information? The web, internet. And so this was a hugely positive right direction decision by, by Google. And so we're hoping that the other social media platforms, if you will, are gonna be able to do the same. Now there are a lot of resources out there uh, to find out more and there a lot of scientific organizations, the International Society for Stem Cell Research, the International Society for Cell Therapy, and again, I'm the chief scientific officer for them, uh, Cytotherapy, uh, Canadian Stem Cell Foundation, etc. You all should have seen, um, we put together information sheets uh, with references, looks like most of you picked them up. If not, they're gonna be out in the back when you leave. Uh, so there, there are a lot of web-based resources, if you will. And what have we done locally? So uh, at the last meeting uh, a month ago of the Vermont Medical Society, two res a resolution was adopted that uh, simply says that the VMS disseminate evidence-based information to its members regarding stem cell clinics and therapies and encourage members to have evidence-based discussions with their patients when they inquire about such services and that the VMS coordinate with the appropriate licensing boards to ensure that uh, patients are provided safe and evidence-based information services. That's what we're trying to do here. Again, I'm gonna go back to the statement I've made before. I will not, I cannot, I should not put myself in the shoes of any patient suffering from something. I will not, I can't tell you what to do. What we wanna do is educate you as best possible about the realities of what's out there. So you can make the best possible informed decision for yourself. So, I think we're gonna yep, end it up here. Uh, so in summary, we've, we've talked about regenerative medicine. Uh, we've talked about uh, all these different types of stem cells and all the promise and the excitement and legitimate scientific advances uh, that are ongoing. And then we've uh, talked about the unproven stem cell therapies, how they came to be, what they do, what the backlash is, uh, developing backlash is. And again, most importantly, what information resources are available to you so that you can take this once uh, we're done tonight. So with that, yep, so uh, I wanna thank you for your time and attention and let's have, let's have a long talk, let's have questions. How have the bogus clinics influenced or had an impact on the actual research and clinical trials? No, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, anytime there is illegitimate use of, or, or um, uh, use of something, it detracts from the real stuff, if you will. Why? Because Patients will get discouraged. Well, this stem cell therapy doesn't work. Why should I use my taxpayer dollar to try and support real research? Legislators will also get the same they hear from constituents. It's bogus, why, you understand? So that's, that's one of the potential direct connect the dots with that. Um, less a question as a, a comment or an observation. So I, I work for a malpractice insurance carrier mm -hmm. and just recently within the last you know year or so we've had a orthopedic big big practice wanting to well everybody else is doing this our patients are asking for we could make money doing this shouldn't we do this mm -hmm. and you know I that's why I'm here I mean I, we got all sorts of information and said this is a bad thing do not do this and we, we won't insure you if something goes wrong, but it's just frightening that just the, the pressure that they're maybe well, sure. getting or the, the need to make money or want to make more money. No, absolutely, and so let me expand on that because orthopedics, if you remember that bar graph, 
is by far and away the largest target area. And there's some really good potential legitimate uses of cell-based therapies in orthopedics, all right? Um, but again, back to your point, this is gonna be potentially obfuscated by the bad stuff out there too. Bottom line though is that again, there's no, ins no insurance company's gonna pay for this type of stuff um, until there's proven efficacy as well as safety. I'm, I'm just following the microphone here. One right here. Yes, you said that there was no interventional stuff going on. I thought Takahashi in Japan had no, started no, a no, 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 no induced pluripotent stem cell interventional studies going on. I think Dr. Jun Takahashi at Kyoto University has started a small trial with seven car Parkinson's patients. Well, th I mean, that's good to hear if it's legitimate. My simple point, it wasn't listed on the clinicaltrials.gov website when okay. I last looked. So my question is, given that I'm one of the thousand Vermonters with Parkinson's disease, and so I'm very interested in the stem cell mm -hmm. stuff, uh, given that there's a proven uh, autoimmune process going on in Parkinson's disease, how does stem cell therapy interact with people with autoimmune diseases? So, it, so that's a, that's a long answer question. Let me try and break that down. So in terms of induced pluripotent stem cells, the idea is to grow new neurons, dopaminergic producing neurons that will then replace the failed ones and bring back the function that's lost in Parkinson's, right? But if there's an autoimmune process that's gonna come back and destroy those anyway, then it's kind of a vicious circle. So then you switch gears a little bit. Well, what kind of cell therapy out there could potentially work against the immune system, and that gets to the MSCs, all right, because they have those uh, immune regulatory properties. And so, um, to my mind, uh, and again, I'm not a neurologist, uh, I understand what you're saying. I don't know if IP, the induced pluripotent stem cells or the mesenchymal stromal cells, the MSCs, are the better approach for Parkinson's right now. Does that make sense? Again, this is why the, um, the science is so important to understand. It may be, who knows? Speculate, speculate. Maybe, maybe, maybe both of them. Dan, I have, well, I'm sorry, well, I, I have two questions. Yes, okay. The first one is, in order to speed up the research, the approval process, something called RMAT was yes. developed. Would RMAT have stopped thalidomide babies? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so we talked about, I, I don't know when you came in, but we did talk about RMAT quite a bit. Yes, you did, but, um, I mean, but, but the idea I, being that yeah, we I, want I, to be able to stop, sure, we want I, to make sure that it's efficacious. Yeah, Would RMAT I, have stopped thalidomide babies? So I haven't thought about that. Um, I don't know, actually. I, I, I really don't know. I mean, thalidomide was an anti-nausea drug during pregnancy, right. and with the wisdom of hindsight, it seems hard to fathom how the effect on birth, on, on, the, on the developing fetus, wasn't part of the studies for the lidomide. So, um, but I think lessons learned from sure. things like that. So I think, again, the underlying principle for everything the FDA does, including RMAT, is safety. I understand. Second question, yep. you had a slide that showed differentiation of stem cells one of which forms into Optimus Prime? Yeah. I wanna know how that happens. <laughs> uh, another, another, uh, another evening, so. I have a quick question. Where, where am I looking? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah, just back to, do you see any application of this to people with traumatic spinal injuries, regenerating spinal cords? Or well, again, potentially. I mean, because if you can convince, let's go back to that induced pluripotent stem cell. You turn it into a neuron, and then you figure out how to administer it, uh, presumably directly into the spinal cord, um, then there's all, again, this is the hope, right? There are possibilities that it could, um, uh, what's the word I wanna say? It, it'll sink in and do the right thing. Is okay. anybody doing work specifically on spinal cord? There's a injuries. lot of, is spinal there? cord injuries are one of the, the a, are a major target area of all the different cell-based therapies. Again, think back to, um, uh, the, the first, embryo, that, um, first embryonic stem cell trial with the spinal motor, uh, spinal motor atrophy. Again, it's not a traumatic injury, but it's still a spinal cord injury. So lessons learned from that apply to trauma. Doc. Yes. The stem cells have come into fashion recently with PRP being sort of the 
preceded. Do you have any thoughts on PRP therapy? Yeah, so, so um, let, let's define this for everybody, okay? So PRP, platelet-rich plasma, all right? So essentially, um, this is, uh, how can you best describe this? You get platelets out of the body, and then you let the, collect the condition, things that they secrete, okay? And legitimately, they contain a lot of growth factors and hormone, things that potentially could have beneficial effects. And so there's, again, in the world of scientific legitimacy, there's, some ex there's a fair amount of excitement about platelet-rich plasma. And there are studies, uh, mostly in orthopedic applications, and again, this is not my field, um, that show potential benefit. But conversely, there's studies and other studies in orthopedic that don't show, orthopedic applications that don't show benefits, okay? Um, I've been approached um, directly about questions about PRP for lung injuries, for emphysema, and there is zero evidence about this. And so, again, it's not a cell, it's a cell, pro cell products, if you will, and so maybe there's some legitimacy right now, but I don't think we're there yet. As someone suffering from multiple myeloma, we're, we're, a cancer, oh, yes, a, a cancer oh, yeah. of the blood and bone, I was surprised with the one graph that you showed where the, the cancer, the number of cancer applications was very far to the right, almost minuscule in terms of uh, any significance. Right. Yet here in, in Vermont, I've met a wonderful support group where there are many people who with stem cell transplants have been living five, 10, 15 years. Right longer than expected. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm a bit surprised about no mention of applications in terms of that particular well, but, but, cancer. But, but again, this, this is where it's critically important to understand that one size doesn't fit all, mm -hmm. okay? So the stem cell transplants that have been used for cancer treatments are the hematopoietic stem cells, those HSCs. Those are well-established therapies for bone marrow transplantation, again, for leukemias, lymphomas, um, I think myelomas, but again, I'm not an oncologist, yes. um, and all that too. And so these, these are available, these are out there. There are more cancer therapies that are developing using cells, and we'll go back to the T cells. You've heard about, uh, many of you seen these CAR T cells, which are really phenomenally miraculous, if you will. Um, but when you go to that graph, again, uh, these clinics, um, don't generally, offer, that I'm aware of, offer anti-cancer treatments um, using mesenchymal stem cells, all right? Uh, because, and that's really the main focus of this. And so, again, I if you have myeloma or you have another malignancy, talk to your oncologist because there are legitimate cell-based therapies out there. Mm -hmm. Does that, does that yeah, answer your question? I want to make sure I'm really yes, getting to the nut of your yes, question. Yes, it's, it's just that you hadn't mentioned that before, and I think it's good to give people that hope that there is indeed proven, substantially proven over yep. many so I, years. I thought, so, so let me reinforce that, because um, I thought we had covered it, but in bone marrow transplantation for leukemias, for lymphomas, for other hematologic diseases, which would include myelomas, bone marrow transplantation or blood transplantation with these hematopoietic stem cells, these HSCs, are widely established, been out there for years, and so are available. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm okay, Dr. Weiss, um, you showed a slide that basically summarized the FDA approval process, and I'm summarizing rather grossly, but it looked to me as if we're talking about a three-stage process. First is sort of the scientific logic of the, of the uh, therapy. Second is whether it's safe, and third is whether it actually is effective. Right. whether it works. So if you're looking at potentially doing uh, some stem cell therapy that's not yet approved, but you know there are trials underway, if there's a, if there's a major trial, does that suggest it's in the third stage and that those first two hurdles have been preliminarily uh, cleared? No, not necessarily, because it's, it's very common for an industry in particular to, if they have had a successful phase one trial, 
So again, phase one is that initial safety trial, a relatively small number of people. If a drug is safe, that's a press release. Or if that phase one trial is, um, uh, uh, it, it, it works out. No side effects, no adverse events. The company is gonna trumpet that loud and clear. Why? Because their investors will wanna see that. The stock will go up, things like that. It's real life, okay, it's real life. Same thing with the phase two. So if you hear about clinical trials for new therapeutics that seem to be working, um, it's not, necessar not necessarily that large phase three, huge, big safety, uh, I'm so sorry, uh, is this drug as good as or better than current standard of care? Actually, when you actually look at the clinicaltrials.gov too, the vast majority of the trials for cell-based therapies, um, particularly the MSCs, are still phase one and phase two, okay? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. In the case of uh, uh, injury, acute injury to the lung from vaping oh, interesting. incidents. Oh, Yeah, isn't that interesting, um, okay. Would it be uh, plausible until a stem cell process was worked out and a, right. et cetera, approved, can you see the application of, say, growth factors alone that might help these young people regenerate tissue, yeah. maybe part and parcel with a lung transplant? So, so I'm gonna go off on a, a little bit of tangent here, okay, because um, within the world of these MSCs, okay, not HSCs, um, but MSCs, mesenchymal stromal cells, um, the way I look at it is that these cells, uh, when they get injected into the blood, they stick around for a day or two or three, and then they're gone. They're actually cleared out of the body. And so what you want, where I think the most effective application of an MSC-based cell therapy is for a situation in which you have an acute, high-intensity inflammatory process. So like the vaping lung, vaped lungs, if you will. So, uh, I'm involved in uh, uh, clinical trials uh, and uh, uh, preclinical trials of uh, a variety of lung diseases, and there's one particularly devastating lung disease called the acute respiratory distress syndrome. All right now, again, this is getting a little bit uh, into my world. All right, but uh, this is where a lot of critically ill patients in the intensive care unit on ventilators, um, because their lungs have just been destroyed by whatever's going on, an acute high intensity situation. So to me, that is a situation where MSCs have the best chance of success. And there was a, clinically, a, a clinical trial uh, done last year by an industry company in which these MSCs worked, okay? The, the, we've seen the data. Uh, the, the published scientific literature is gonna come out shortly. And so I'm gonna bring that full circle to a vaped lung, all right? maybe. This could be an approach for a vaped lung, if you will, okay? Um, so this is something that we, I hadn't thought about, but what a great idea, all right? I'm also gonna, let me go off on one other tangent too. Um, there are places in the world, uh, US included, um, where compassionate use uh, applications can be uh, put in place for cell-based therapy. And uh, this is another avenue, but the, you're talking about the most desperate situation. But there are uh, instances in which cell-based therapy with MSCs have been applied in uh, desperate, no, no hold bars type situations, so. Um, I was wondering, I think I read something about this and I wasn't sure if it was just science fiction or if it was true or <laughs> um, something in the near future perhaps um, about using animal systems to um, sort of power stem cells on scaffolds or even just limbs or, but using animal bodies to grow them specifically. So um, I think I know what you're talking about. Let me explain that. So, so again, this is gonna go uh, kind of full circle to things that I do, which is I'm trying to grow new lungs outside of the body, right? So to do that, um, and, and why do I do this? Because end-stage lung disease like emphysema or pulmonary fibrosis or cystic fibrosis, there is no cure. And so at the end of the day, uh, patients need a lung transplant, 
Okay, all right, and we have a lung transplant recipient here with us today, cystic fibrosis. But there are not enough lungs to go around. And so if we can figure out how to grow them outside of the body. So how do you grow a new tissue? You know, how do I, how do I mold a lung? So the best way to do it is you need a scaffold, like an erector set, in a sense. And so the, it turns out that the best scaffold is a lung itself. So a lot of the things, so to give you an example, I, I get lungs from slaughterhouse, for example, pig lungs. And then what I can do is I can treat them and get rid of all the pig cells, pig lung cells. So I'm left with that underlying scaffold, that underlying erector set. And then if I can figure out how to put human lung cells or human stem cells that'll turn into lung cells into that pig lung, you know, pig lungs really kind of look like human lungs, <laughs> right? And so um, that's, uh, I think, do you understand? I, I think, does that answer your question? In a sense, okay. I, you, you lost me on that one, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. All right, other questions? Yes. So the question is, um, is CRISPR technology applicable in any of this stuff? So CRISPR, um, uh, to take all this and compress it to this, um, there are now techniques uh, that are called gene editing, right? And what that means, if you have some sort of genetic defect, a chromosomal defect, um, we have ways now of going in and, and it's very simplistically snip out the bad part and put in, a, put in the new DNA, if you will, all right? So gene editing. It's absolutely a part of this. And so, for example, think about the induced pluripotent stem cell. If I wanted to help a patient with cystic fibrosis, for example, a genetic disease, okay, there's a defective DNA that underlies all the problems with CF. Then I would take that skin biopsy, then I would turn on those genes that were normally turned off after, embryo after fetal development was con uh, completed, de-differentiate that cell into an induced pluripotent stem cell, and then I would use the gene editing to fix the defective gene make it a normal gene, and then derive the lung cells that I would want to then somehow put back in the patient. So, very much so. I, what? Yesterday's science fiction is today's science, okay? <laughs> or today's science fiction is tomorrow's science. There you go. All right, any um, questions, thoughts? All right, well, thank you again. Thanks.